Welcome to Anchored by Truth, brought to you by Crystal Sea Books. In John 14.6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Our goal is to encourage everyone to grow in the Christian faith by anchoring themselves to the secure truth found in the inspired, inerrant, and infallible Word of God. But you, O Bethlehem Ephrathah, are only a small village among all the people of Judah, yet a ruler of Israel, whose origins are in the distant past, will come from you on my behalf. Micah, chapter 5, verse 2, New Living Translation. Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the reign of King Herod. The Gospel of Matthew, chapter 2, verse 1, New Living Translation. Hello, I'm Victoria Kay. Welcome to Anchored by Truth, brought to you by Crystal Sea Books. I'm here today with R.D. Fierro, author and founder of Crystal Sea Books and part-time barista. He turns on the coffee maker and puts in those little cups. <laughs> today on Anchored by Truth, as we approach Thanksgiving and Christmas, we are continuing our series where we focus on the earthly birth and life of Jesus. In today's culture, it seems as though just about everybody has heard about Jesus, but fewer and fewer people actually know much about him. Do you agree with that, R.D.? Yes. Jesus' name is certainly very well known in modern culture, but unfortunately there is probably as much or more misinformation that circulates around Jesus than there is actual fact and real information. I'm afraid that most people, probably too many people, get their information, what they know about Jesus, from watching television specials or movies or any other questionable sources than they do from reading the Bible or from studying the many fine and very well-documented books and articles that have been produced by excellent Christian scholars down through the years. That's the bad news. The good news is that for those who are truly interested in knowing the actual historical Jesus, the biblical Jesus, it's probably easier today than any time in history to get accurate information. But you do have to be careful about the sources you use. So today we want to continue to provide the listeners of Anchored by Truth with a head start on doing their own study about Jesus. As you have so often said, Jesus is the centerpiece of both the Bible and the plan of redemption. So to be confident not only in our faith, but to help those who are still looking for anchors for their own lives, it's imperative we know the real Jesus of the Bible. But before we get too deep into our discussion, how about telling us a little bit about the Christmas poem we're going to continue today? I'd love to. As I mentioned in an earlier episode of Anchored by Truth, years ago when I worked in one of those big state agency buildings that are so common here, I wanted to give Christmas presents to some of my co-workers. But when you want to give out Christmas presents in a state agency, that can be a little tricky because of the gift restrictions and dollar limits and things like that. So one year I decided that the one present I could give everybody was a little entertainment. So I wrote this poem, this piece, that was inspired by some of the things that used to entertain the kids of my generation. I wrote this Christmas story, I wrote it in six parts, and I wrote it so that each part ended in a sort of cliffhanger, and that left everybody wondering what would come next. Well, that story became what's now called The Golden Tree, Kamari's Quest. And it was about a group of koala bears who had gone on a quest to the great far north to find their creator that they called the great white koala bear. Well, those bears never found their creator, but they did find a golden tree that was in the north, that was in the Arctic, and it created a valley that was a perfect place for them to live. Well, later on, I created a new story that I called the Golden Tree Eagle Enigma. And now we followed up on that with part three of the overall story, the Golden Tree Trilogy, that we call the Frost Lion. Now, in part one of the Frost Lion, that we heard on our last episode of Anchored by Truth, we've learned that there are two young koala bears who are now confronting a dilemma that they believe might threaten their village. 
From the vantage point at the top of a very tall hill near their town, they've seen a strange shape out on the distant snow that seems to be walking toward their village, but they don't know who or what that strange shape is. All right then, so let's continue with the story. Here's part two of Crystal Sea's Christmas epic poem, The Golden Tree, The Frost Lion. To the village you must haste, said Copal, the elders to summon and warn. I will remain and keep vigil from here, lest others join this shadowy form. Coest eased back from the high peak, as silent as a flake when it falls. But the dark storm stirred, rolled, and groaned, so from stealthily movement she stalled. With a great effort, the fallen figure arose, and its cape fell back from its head. Copal and Coest gasp in silence, as if they saw one rise from the dead. For when the cape fell... No demon appeared, but a koala, as clear as could be. But this was no bear either of them knew, no bear from their village of the tree. This bear is like us, but very near death, whispered Coest to Kapal. See, he stumbles, he can barely walk. Soon again he surely will fall. I will go down, his condition to see. Paul said with grim intent. For if he is kin, we cannot but help. But he might by the demon be sent. You remain here. If any danger you sense, then you must be ready to flee. I will not abandon you, protested Coest, no matter what peril I see. You are a good friend, this I know, Paul urgently replied. But from the village, it's help we will need, if this strange bear is not on our side. Kapal arose, the downward slope to descend. He soon reached the figure below. But as he arrived again, Coest saw the strange bear fall to the snow. Kapal waved and Coest left her place. Soon at the two she arrived. The fallen bear weakly groaned and said, My companion by now may have died. I beg of you now, please find my friend. He is behind me in the snow. If he's alive, your help he will need. It's to him, I pray, you will go. The new bear friend, face weak and pale, his breath ragged and low. So with his cape as a sled, Coest and Copal began to drag him through the snow. Once in the village, he received tender care. In Coray's home, bright and warm, he began to recover. But as other bears he saw, with surprise, his face was adorned. So the legend is true. Many generations ago, Koalas went far to the north. So few in my town believe the old tales. We were mocked when we set forth. Why did you come? What is your name? How did you know we are here? An avalanche of questions tumbled about from small bears who had gathered quite near. Hush! Go away! Koray scattered her brood. Let this bear find some rest. Hot honey, strong tea, and good bread. Fetch quickly, my daughter, Coest. Uh, no, no, called the stranger. He struggled to stand, but his legs quickly gave way. My friend is lost. I must find him. We were parted when we lost the sleigh. Peace, my friend. Coray eased him down. We have sent for Kojan and Kodan. They are the wisest and bravest of bears. They will know how best to plan. But what is your name, and why are you here? It might help us if something we know. The strange bear fell back, his eyes far away, 
and an odd look on his face soon showed. My tale is sad. It will bring no joy. I fear it is grim and gray. But it must be told, lest my quest be void. For who knows whether I survive this day. The drama is now building. What we've heard is that the bears have enjoyed the peace and plenty in the valley for generations, but now a new bear from a strange land is in their midst, and that bear is very near death. Worse, this new bear has a friend who is still lost in the deep winter snow and may already have died. So the bears are learning, just like in the real world, that there are always unexpected events in this world that may require us to respond, and it may take real courage to confront those events. And commitment and sacrifice. And it's hard to have those virtues if we don't know why we've been sent on our own quests, isn't it? I mean, God's grace has saved us just like the golden tree saved the bears. But as the Apostle Paul said to the Philippians, they had to, quote, work hard to show the results of their salvation, obeying God with deep reverence and fear. For God is working in them and us, giving them and us the desire and power to do what pleases Him. Unquote. Right. You know, there's an old song that says, There is no way to be happy in Jesus other than to trust and obey. Well, part of the obedience to Jesus is to be able to tell others why we believe that Jesus is qualified to be our Savior. And that ability for us to tell others about Jesus is to assure ourselves that Jesus was a real historical figure, not a myth, and not some kind of a pious concoction just crafted in someone's imagination thousands of years ago. You know, in our day and age, one of the criticisms that's hurled against the Christian faith is that the Jesus that Christians worship is either a mythological figure or if Jesus even existed at all, that we can't trust the gospel accounts for information about him. But the truth is, Jesus was a real person. And we see that from passages like the one we used for our opening scriptures. In those passages, we can see that the Bible tells us specific facts about Jesus, like where he was born in Bethlehem, and when, during the reign of a king named Herod. But beyond even what scripture tells us, Jesus' life is a fact that is even confirmed by sources outside the Bible, isn't it? And that's what you wanted to focus on today, right? The fact that we have historical sources beside the Bible that confirm Jesus' historicity and even confirm many of the details contained in the Gospels about his life, death, and circumstances. Right. Now, in some earlier episodes of Anchored by Truth, we've discussed the fact that you can use the existence of the physical creation and apply logic and reason to your observations, and you can arrive at the conclusion that there is a self-existent being who is responsible for the creation of the universe and all living creatures. But that line of reasoning can only carry you so far in an understanding of God. And it would almost give us no information about the other attributes that are essential parts of the Christian faith, such as the plan of redemption, or Jesus' role in the plan of redemption. To know about that, we need a special revelation from that self-existent being, God. And fortunately, we have that special revelation in the Bible. But again, we need to be persuaded fully ourselves that that revelation is true and trustworthy. And once again, we can use logic and reason and evidence to help play a role in validating the Bible's claim that it is the inspired Word of God. And that's what Anchored by Truth as a program is here to do. And also, when you're talking about the figure of Jesus specifically, there are extra-biblical sources that can also be helpful in validating the confidence that we have in the Bible. Now, I want to hasten to add that such extra-biblical sources don't add anything to the Bible. But what those sources can do is to add to our individual confidence that the Bible is describing history accurately when it speaks of historical events. So today, you want to take a brief look at some other historical sources that also confirm that Jesus was a real historical figure. You know when you think about it, 
It's remarkable that there would be any other surviving sources outside the Bible who would mention Jesus. In his day and time, if Jesus hadn't been the Son of God, he would have been just another obscure and unimportant itinerant preacher that had a brief public ministry in a distant Roman province. He never led an army, held a government or political position, or even wrote a book. Plus, his public ministry only lasted about three years, and he didn't travel all that widely. His public ministry was all conducted within 100 miles of his home, and he died the death of a common criminal. So, if Jesus wasn't who he claimed to be, the Son of the Almighty God, he should have faded from the pages of history as just another local crank. But he didn't. He is mentioned by some of the most important historians of his age, men who had far more earthly distinction than he did. Where do you want to start? Well, let's start by a couple of examples of well-known Roman historians who are widely regarded as having written important histories of the Roman Empire and its conquests. The examples that we're going to use today came from an article that's available on the website coldcasechristianity.com, and the article is entitled, Is There Any Evidence for Jesus Outside the Bible? And that's just one source for this kind of information. And we're going to put a link to that article on the notes that accompany the podcast version of this show. But all of the examples we're going to use, they're very well known, and they can be found in a number of historical reference sources, so people can find them in places other than just that article that we used for our particular source on this show. So the first example we want to quote of an extra-biblical source is a quote from Cornelius Tacitus. And Tacitus was a well-known Roman historian, and he's frankly among the most trusted of the ancient historians. Tacitus was a senator under the Roman Emperor Vespasian, and he was also the pro-council of Asia. Now, in Tacitus's Annals from the year 116 AD, he describes the Roman Emperor Nero's response to the great fire in Rome, and Nero's claim that the Christians were the ones to blame for the fire. And I'm quoting Tacitus now. Consequently, to get rid of the report, Nero fastened the guilt and inflicted the most exquisite tortures on a class hated for their abominations called Christians by the populace. Christus, from whom the name had its origin, suffered the extreme penalty during the reign of Tiberius at the hands of one of our procurators, Pontius Pilate, and a most mischievous superstition, thus checked for the moment, again broke out not only in Judea, the first source of the evil, but even in Rome, where all things hideous and shameful from every part of the world find their center and become popular. So in this account, Tacitus confirms that there was a man who lived in Judea, who was known as Christus or Christ, was crucified under Pontius Pilate, and who had followers who called themselves by his name and were being persecuted for following him. Well, this account is helpful because it directly confirms a number of details about Jesus. But it's also important for another reason, isn't it? A few episodes ago, we talked about the fact that Luke and the other gospel writers were meticulous when it came to their historical recording and reporting. So much so, that they got some obscure details right, even when other ancient historians got them wrong. So this quote from Tacitus helps illustrate that point too, doesn't it? Very good. That's pretty impressive. You noticed that Tacitus called Pontius Pilate the procurator of Judea, not the prefect. Thank you. I try. And you're absolutely right. As good a historian as Tacitus was, he was human, and in this case he did make a mistake. He got Pilate's title wrong. For many years, there were questions about the existence and the actual title of Pontius Pilate, who, of course, was the Roman governor who presided over the trial of Jesus. Later Roman writers, as well as almost all Bible reference works, referred to Pilate as the procurator of Judea. But Luke and the other gospel writers called Pilate a governor, not a procurator. And the fact that governor was the correct title was confirmed in 1961 when a two-by-three-foot stone was discovered that had a Latin inscription. And the translation of that inscription read as follows, Pontius Pilate, prefect of Judea, has presented the Tiberium to the Caesareans. Now, this find, this stone tablet, was not only archaeological confirmation for the existence of Pilate, but it was also confirmation that Pilate was the prefect or governor of Judea. In fact, we now know that the title procurator was not used at the time of Jesus' trial for the Roman governors. 
This title only came into usage at a later time during the reign of the emperor Claudius, A.D. 41 through 54. During Claudius's reign, the title of Roman governors shifted from prefect to procurator. So, although Tacitus was correct about the title in the use for the Roman governor of Judea at the time he wrote, about 60 years later, strictly speaking, that was not Pilate's actual title when he supervised the trial and execution of Jesus. Pilate was a prefect, a governor, not a procurator. A fact the Bible writers got right. So, what's next on the list of extra-biblical writers? Well, before we close for today, we should certainly take a look at one of the most famous of the ancient historians, Josephus. Because Josephus lived so close to the time of Jesus, and he was present during the period of the early church's formation. Josephus lived from 37 AD to 101 AD. And the most widely accepted year for the crucifixion of Jesus was 33 AD. So Josephus was born just a handful of years after the crucifixion. And he wrote an extensive history of the Jews in 93 AD called The Antiquities of the Jews. So when you hear people referring to Josephus, you'll often hear them just call it Antiquities. Now, Josephus wrote more about Jesus in more detail than any other non-biblical historian, and Josephus himself was a really interesting character. Josephus was a consultant for Jewish rabbis, and he actually became a Galilean military commander by the age of 16. And he was an eyewitness to much of what he recorded in the first century A.D., Well, as a Jewish military leader, Josephus initially fought against the Romans, but he later surrendered to the Romans, and he eventually became an advisor to the Roman Emperor Vespasian. Now, under Vespasian, Josephus was allowed to write his history. And this history includes three passages about Christians, one of which he describes the death of John the Baptist, one of which he mentions the execution of James, and describes James as the brother of Jesus the Christ, and a final passage which describes Jesus as a wise man and the Messiah. Now, there are some controversies that swirl around the writings of Josephus, so we have to be careful when we're quoting from Josephus to ensure that we use only the ones that are the most conservative from a scholarly standpoint. So why don't you read one of the most conservative scholarly reconstructions of one of Josephus's most famous passages? Quote, Now around this time lived Jesus, a wise man, for he was a worker of amazing deeds and was a teacher of people who gladly accept the truth. He won over both many Jews and many Greeks. Pilate, when he heard him accused by the leading men among us, condemned him to the cross, but those who had first loved him did not cease doing so. To this day, the tribe of Christians named after him has not disappeared." Now, there are actually some ancient versions of Josephus' writings which are even more explicit about the nature of Jesus' miracles, about his life, and about his status as the Christ. But even from this very conservative version, we can conclude a number of important things. Jesus lived in Palestine. He was a wise man and a teacher. He worked some amazing deeds. And he was accused by the Jews and then ultimately crucified under Pontius Pilate. And finally, that he had followers called Christians. Now, Josephus' observations are particularly compelling because at the time he wrote was very close to when Jesus had lived. So even though Josephus wasn't like one of the apostles who actually walked with Jesus, Josephus could see around him the spreading effect of the gospel. And Josephus may very well have had the opportunity to talk to Jews who had been in and around Judea when Jesus had his public ministry there. Well, those two examples are a good introduction to the fact that Jesus' earthly life has confirmation outside the Bible. Next time, we can take up a few more examples, but before we close for today, a few general observations would seem to be in order. And you said that the early church itself is a confirmation that Jesus was a real historical figure. Exactly. There is no dispute that in the first century A.D., Christians and the Christian church began to be an issue within the Roman Empire. They were so widely known that even the Roman emperor Nero blamed the great fire of Rome on them. Well, it would be impossible to explain the spread of a movement if there wasn't something or someone who started the movement. Remember that the Romans weren't known for being timid administrators of their provincial empire, and in the first century AD, they certainly weren't friendly to Christians. 
So something remarkable must have happened in the early part of the first century A.D. in Judea that animated so many people to be willing to carry this message throughout the Roman Empire despite the official opposition they were encountering everywhere. Well, there are two basic reasons that they were willing to do so. First, they were persuaded that something truly remarkable had happened. A dead man had arisen from the grave, walked around for 40 days, talked to people, ministered, and ultimately went back to heaven. And the second reason is that they had a source of strength and support, the Holy Spirit, who sustained them as they were carrying their message to a world that needed that message but did not want to receive it. Well, all that makes perfect sense. As Paul said to the Romans, the same power that raised Jesus from the dead also empowers us and gives us the ability to carry on in his name. Sounds like a perfect time to go to prayer. Since we're approaching Thanksgiving, how about if today we listen to a prayer for that special day when we turn our attention to the goodness that God has shown to us. A Prayer Celebrating Thanksgiving Blessed and Wonderful Father, You are the one true God, the Lord and Master of all. We praise and glorify Your name, for You are mighty in deed and in name. You are the foundation of our faith, our sure hope, and the source of all our blessings. Lord, we want to thank You for those blessings, so many of which are manifest on this day. History tells us that our forefathers established thanksgiving as a way to acknowledge your provision in their lives. We want to continue in their footsteps to acknowledge that all good gifts come only from you and that we are completely dependent upon you for all our needs. We pray that you will be merciful to us in the future, even as you have been in the past. We praise you that you have continually provided for us even in those times when we were hard-pressed and struggling. We are amazed and blessed by your generosity and kindness. Father, among our greatest blessings are those of family and friends. Help us always to cherish them and to not take them for granted. We know that there are many this day who are without their families and far away from their friends. We pray that you would be a powerful and immediate presence to them. We pray that you would be the great comforter to them, closer than a brother, and more real than the air they breathe. Bring to our minds any who have need of the comfort that we can provide. Inspire us to reach out to them in the way that will bring them the most comfort. We especially remember our soldiers, whose duties have separated them from their loved ones, and we remember their loved ones. We pray that you would be the tie that binds them together, no matter what distance is between them. We pray that you would guide us to be the heart and hands of Jesus, to minister to them, ever calling to our minds that there are always times when we will need others to be Jesus to us. Thank you for the food we share and enjoy this day. It is the visible and tangible reminder you know our needs and provide them. As we break bread in fellowship and thanksgiving, We are reminded that the heavenly bread with which you met our deepest need was the body of your precious Son. We praise you especially for the atonement that he made for our sins, and it is in his holy and blessed name that we pray and give thanks. Amen. Amen. We'd like to remind our audience that a lot of our radio episodes are linked together in series of topics, so if they've missed any episodes, or if they just want to hear one again, all of these episodes are available on your favorite podcast app. We'd also like to remind listeners that copies of The Golden Tree, Komari's Quest, and The Golden Tree, Eagle Enigma, are available from our website. We hope you'll be with us next time, and we hope you'll take some time to encourage some friends to tune in also or listen to the podcast version of this show. If you'd like to hear more, try out crystalcbooks.com, where... We're not perfect, but our boss is.